This is Kenny, Scorston, Jonesy, Wallace, Kennedy. I, at least I don't quite remember. This is Bill Doerr, Thompson, that's me. I think is uh, No, I can't remember. He was our ball third man. He was our engineer. He, he had a top turret. He had a side gunner. See, we're one man short here. Albert J. Kosher. Well, I was working at the movie house, collecting tickets, when the flash came that the Japanese raided Hawaii. And that started it. When I went home that night, I told my mother that I think I'm going to join. She was dumbstounded. Oh, she, see, I lost my father when I was two and a half years old. And she raised all of us by herself. And I guess she thought she'd better agree with me. And she did. And a friend of mine and I, we decided to join the Air Corps. Well, we, I got together with my friend and his father, and they took us to the recruiting station, and we both signed up for the Air Corps. I was always air-minded, and I wanted to fly, and that's it. We had to go to Philadelphia to sign in, I did, and he took me over. He says, how would you like to be stationed in Philadelphia? I said, no, sir. That's it. Then they gave us uh, questionnaires, but we would like to be in what branch. I picked radio, radio gunner. And my friend did too. They gave us a little test. After we passed that, they sent us to communications. You had, at that time, they used the Morse code. And you had to pass so many letters per minute to pass. My friend did pass before me, but I followed not too far. Then we were sent to gunnery school, and the first thing they gave us was a shotgun. And they took us out to the uh, range, and we were shooting that claim pigeons. Well, I used shotgun before, and the instructor came over and said, did you ever shoot a shotgun? I said, yes, sir. He says, how? I said, rabbit hunting, pheasant hunting. He says, I thought some. So they asked me on. I went to the Schmuelbund, and there it was a real rougher. But I passed all right. I went to 50 caliber. Went through this daily cleaning and the works. But our turn came to fly in the third. And we went through that. Different 
graves. A guy in the pit would release the clay pigeon and we would have to track it and fire. That was a lot of fun, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> but they got used to it. Well, we all passed it. I guess we named her Cabrita. They said you're going to meet your crew. And they took page, and there was a bunch of guys coming down, and my crew came over towards me. We met each other, and that's how we got together. We start flying together. And well, there was a relief, and yet it, it was mixed a little. And then they sent us to our field where we would get our plane. And I think it was in Salt Lake City. I'm not sure or quite, but uh, we flew quite a bit from there. So we did fire our guns at flying targets, and it was time to head overseas. We landed in Ireland, it was in Ireland. And on the way there, it seemed like the pilot and the radio man were the only ones awake. And it was so monotonous, I broke the rules. I was supposed to be radio silent. I asked the girl in Ireland for a weather report. I thanked her and waited for a while. And I asked for another one. That was bad. And uh, it wasn't very long we landed in Ireland and everything was all right. During the night, one member of the crew and I, we looked out at the sky, and there was a raid, but they were sending not in the aircraft shells. And I looked at my buddy, and he looked at me. I says, "Boy, is that what we're getting into?" <laughs> but after a while, we were assigned fields. Well. We had a loudspeaker in our bedroom, you know, and they both could stop at a certain time. We did go for breakfast. And one thing I didn't approve of, flying personnel had everything fresh, fresh eggs, fresh milk. The ground crew, Eight over on little, they has everything cleared. They're the guys that kept the planes flying, you know. Uh, then they took us in the briefing, and we're all in there. It was pretty crowded, and they give us all information, and that's what they called me into the office and gave me the information on what to do. They always offered us a pickup to take us to the our plane. The driver of our plane was a fella I knew from Woodbine. He was out any time I take a crew out, 
they never get shot down. I thought, oh my God, I hope I get them every time. But it passed over. Then the first raid that you go on, they have a, an experienced crew come to get you in the plane, get you his guns, and everything was set up. That's fine. We got out on the runway and then we took off. Then the ball or good tour man said, I can charge my guns. And over there, they put it this way. You can't charge it. Pilot said, they just follow the plane with your guns. They don't know what they are, you know. And that was all right. Now we're flying. Oh, well, we joined all planes. They joined on us. We were getting over to the English Channel. I'm on the radio. I don't hear the pilot. All of a sudden, I went, boom. Oh, my. I almost went. <laughs> he said, that's firing all your guns. So you could imagine the noise. <laughs> I, I just fired my life. <laughs> and that was it. And we went on to the target. When we took off, we had to, we were issued parachutes. We had English style parachutes. You put the harness on and the parachute is folded up with two hooks. You hook them and it's on. Otherwise, mine was always under the table. Which was living birds more. Oh, well, after the English Channel, the bombardier called me to fall the bomb pins. The bomb pins were safety. The bombs had a, a, a nose where a rod would go in and set the explosions off. The pins kept them out. And that's what I pulled off. And I told them that the pins were out, everything was gone. We got to the target, the bottom bay doors. I have to say the bottom bay doors open. We, bombed, we dropped the bombs. I had to open mine. The bottom all bottom bay doors open. But it was to us, it looked like it could have, couldn't be any worse. But to the veterans, it was an easier one, you know. But we went back. You know, when we got back from our first mission, they sent the very plane crash on takeoff. And when we found out who it was, who, it was the experienced crew that started us off on our first. And I thought the people around there, they said there was a couple of guys were on fire and they were running wild like, you know. And I'm, 
I have a well, we all know something's going to happen, but when it does, it makes you feel awful, real bad. So, oh, outside some fighter activities we had, plenty of heavy aircraft, you know, but outside of that, we took a couple of little homes in the plane. We got back, we landed good. And after we landed, the pickup truck came to pick us up and took us over to the landing briefing building. And as soon as we walked in, there was two girls standing there, believe it or not, with the shot of shot. Hey, I, I wasn't a drinker, but let me ask it. I did think if the, and that we, I'd helped you, that it settled down a little. And they asked a lot of questions about the fighters, if we do what, Kind of fighters came after us, and just a routine. And after that, they took us to our building. I think some of us just flopped on our bed <laughs> just for a little while. And after we settled down, we Clear case. That's about it, Dutch. Now, certain rage, now, but we had good ones. You know, there was one that was real long. And we went in one way and we came out there, uh, Sweden, or, or, you know, and we were kidding around, we said to the pilot, Jonesy, how about dumping near fuel and made a forced landing? We could get a hotel room and weighing down on us. No. He says, no way. I wanted to get home to my wife. But we did too. You know, we were only kidding. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> It was our way. That was one way. And another one, Pilot said, Hell, get the sandwiches out. Peanut up under and jelly. Frozen. It's radio man, I'll do it. They gave me a, the electric mop. I have to take one at a time. Full mail, the end of mail. That was the dollar. <laughs> um, it was freezing. Well, we we flew in between fifteen thousand and twenty thousand. We wanted it by 25,000. We figured out the further we go, the less target they, but I don't know, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> but uh, one job of mine, well, it was life choosing. When we were banged up pretty good, if the plane got hit, in my dome, plexiglass dome, I would look out and try to see how many guys or parachutes come out so I could record it. And on one ray, I was doing it and I got hired. Oh, they did give us flight vests. 
And for some reason, I put my parachute and flak vest on. I got tired. I let go with my car and just then, bang! I got hit, hit me, but it hit the flak vest. And so it pushed me back. Then. But I told them, Everything's all right because they told the pilot I got hit, but no damage. That was one time. I know they were plenty straight to go shooting. We made, uh, I don't know how many rains. Then we caught the big lead crew. So that's when more jobs fell on the radio man. I guess on all of us. And uh, they told us to target. Hell high, we're going to bomb. What kind of bombs we're going to use? What speed we're going to use? What range? What direction we're going in? What direction we're coming out? And so forth. And they tell us the time we had to be there. Another time, after you get 10,000 feet, each position had to report to the pilot, and that they didn't do something wrong. I didn't report. The waste cutter come over, so grabbed the emergency uh, oxygen bottle and gave it to the revived me. My oxygen uh, dial malfunctioned, and that fast, without oxygen, you pass out. But with that, everything was all right. So I figured, yeah, I guess you didn't mind it too much. I don't know. I just wanted to get it over with. Um, then, you know, anyone I talk to is, were you ever afraid? Uh, no. Uh, not that we were heroes, no. It, it was a different type of feeling. It's hard to explain. I think we worried more about the plane getting hit than we ourselves. And that doesn't make it heroes or anything like that. That's a bunch of baloney. The plane is going to take us back. Yeah. Our hats still the way we can explain that. The I found God is I can explain that. The other thing, it's over with. And watch your Lord. Hold on. And do I forget it? Not really. Hi. Sometimes I'll lay in bed or stand at the dinner table and look out the window and think different things, but not something that would bother me, you know, it's 
something that I went through that I never dreamed that I ever would come through. Maybe that explains it a little now. We were on one prey where the tail gunner got hit. A piece of the flag coming in one side and out the other side. And the poor kid was strictly a left-handed kid. And we took care of him. We banded it. And the waste gunner, one night, believe it or not, I had doubts about him. Nothing personal, but you get a feeling. He lights a cigarette gives it to the kid with oxygen and the big flame will I get put it on the what in the heck are you doing? I said, get over there on your position. Gave him more oxygen and everything was all right. But only little things like that you you have to look forward to, you know it Outside of that, it was wasn't too bad. Well, I say it's new, not too bad now because it's it's over. I had two shots, but I don't know whether I hit or not. One was going away, and the other one. Was gone across. I mean, it just made you feel good. You know, you're doing something. But that's about all. The rest, they did plenty. So, um, the priest, here's how they took care of the flying personnel. You get a pass to go to London. So naturally, you get a few drinks. Not to get drunk, but hey, we're kids. We got a little bit. And peace. Oh, yeah. And peace. You have your wings on. They pick you up. They take you out to the hotel you're at. They put you to bed. That's it. So, well, the ground crew caught on to it. They bought cheap wings. They put it on. Then the, the brass found out about that. They come out. We had to get blue ribbon sewed on, put her wings and the ribbon. Then they would pick us up, take us to the work crowd and thrilled. <laughs> that was it. Well, my friend and I, we never got drunk. We were the drinkers, you know, well, maybe one or two to settle us down. We go to a club and dance. And this Englishman, he come over. He says, Hey, you two, you want to go to a good place, dancing, drinking? Sure, why not? They, he took us. We went there. A lot old. We had to hold hands to keep from getting lost. And there was a very nice club, not a sleazy joint. And there were girls staring, other GIs, and dancing, and a little band. It was nice. We enjoyed ourselves. But the next time we went to London, we couldn't find the guy. And I said to him, a couple of reaching, find it. We looked. 
luck couldn't find. We stopped the English bin and we asked them, how do you get to it? He says, didn't you hear? No. He says, come here. He took us through there. There was nothing there but a big hole. Bud bomb hit it. We were lucky. So we, we pulled the first American by the air raid over Pearl Inn. That was rough back in everything. Usually, over the target, you would get the tar uh, planes yeah. and the aircraft not together. Mm -hmm. Certain things, like Berlin, oh, they'll even throw the stove up at you. Coming in, you get one out of the other. Black or fighters, or fighters or black, you know, but not together. You could tell how bad the target is when you get fighters and black together, like Berlin. I don't know, they're late. Bombs away. Let's go home. That's the thing. The first uh, guys wanted the hair after a raid was when the Heidi looked and said, Bombs away. Let's go home. I have to say that every fish. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, our pilot was the best. Our co-pilot, his name was W.W. W. Wallace. He should have been a pilot, a co-pilot. He says, you know, if they give me a B-17, I'll take it on 30,000 feet and loop it. I says, hey, Wallace, I left my parachute down on the ground. Let me look if you fit it. If you were kidding around, I believe he would have done that. Hey, he was good. The pilot was good, too. You know, yeah. One other thing. When we came back on ship, we came into New York Harbor, and we had quite a few German prisoners. And when we came, they were working, you know, serving us food. When we got to a certain spot, the I didn't see what the heck were they doing. We looked out there, Statue of Liberty. Come to find out, Hitler had told Germany that they bombed the Statue of Liberty. And they couldn't figure out. They found out Hitler was flying. lying. It showed. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, to me, I didn't feel anything toward the freaking earth. Yes, no. One guy, he clobbered one guy, and I thought that was awful. I mean, they were soldiers like us, and I didn't turn them in, but I told them to get them back in line and keep your hands in your pocket. I don't think I was wrong in doing that. And, and, and then we got 
the Philadelphia. There was no buses going to Woodbine. There was a bus that went to Wildwood. My sister and her husband had a saloon and press pond. Not on the board, in the lift. So I called her and says, can you let me in to win behind that pond? Get off there. She says, you get up there. Well, I got on the bus. I said to the conductor, I says, look, when you wake me up, when I don't know how that was about going to Wildwood or something. He never woke me up. I woke up in Delaware. I went to the office. I complained. I says, I, I was tired. This is perfect job. They put me out of the, the and she, Bone for it. I should get. Anyway, I ended up in Philadelphia. They put me on the bus and they sent me all the in the world with. I got to go off at the uh, street I was supposed to. I walked in the back door. I knocked and my sister opened the door and she almost passed out. Boy, she grabbed me and crying. Well, we got over that. And I went in to see my brother-in-law. He said, you were shot at Hachigiana. And there were sailors there. And they kept asking, hey, was it both? And all that. But then I sat and talked with my sister and at a certain time they closed down and they took me over to Woodbine, my lover, and that's it.